let's get started. So this is uh, lecture number two. We are still in the introduction to the introduction to solid state physics. And uh, I think since uh, people come from different backgrounds, it's very useful to uh, get everybody on the same page with some very elementary quantum mechanics, which uh, is also uh, a nice lecture because you will see pretty much all of quantum mechanics that we are going to need in this entire course. Right? So the rest of it we will build during the course. And like I said in the first lecture, there is also some statistical mechanics, statistical physics, or thermodynamics, those concepts that might be useful. Uh, and some of them I will show you today, uh, but uh, I'm not going to review them uh, very extensively. So if we have some gaps in that area, then uh, come talk to me about that. All right, so start from the beginning. Um, who can tell me what this is? <laughs> Schrodinger equation. Right, very good. So this is uh, this is the Schrodinger equation, and uh, has any everyone seen this before? Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so, I'll still say a few words about this equation because uh, uh, all the, the rest of the course is based on this notion that uh, we have quantum particles uh, in periodic potentials. And so, if we understand uh, what uh, that means from quantum mechanical point of view, uh, we can move forward very quickly. Um, so, this equation is, uh, uh, you know, on the first first glance has the structure of the energy equation right, with a kinetic term plus the uh, potential energy term and this is equal to the total energy so the kinetic term is because we have a, a second derivative in position here this is by the way uh, who can tell me uh, more about this equation because there are different Schrodinger equations, right? So this one is so the time independent. Time time independent. Something else about this equation because there's x here, one, one dimensional, dimensional, right? So this is a this you know really the simplest you can write. Uh, so this is a kinetic energy term because this second derivative in momentum is. Uh, a secondary to in position is like uh, momentum squared and this is a potential energy term because this V of X function gives you a potential landscape in one dimension and this E here is the total energy that is a solution of this equation and another thing we're solving for here is a set of these wave functions right so these wave functions are very really fundamental to quantum mechanics uh, they occupy the entire universe, each one of them. Um, of course, they can have, have value zero in large areas of the universe. Like, for example, if you are in a rigid box with infinite walls, then outside that box, wave function will be zero. And uh, the wave function is what describes all particles and all objects in the known universe. Um, so each one of them comes with its own wave function. So this could be a wave function of an electron in a crystal potential that we could be solving here for. A uh, wave function uh, integrated over the entire universe squared uh, normalizes to 1. Right? So this uh, is uh, very critical and uh, then this square of the wave function gives us the probability to find a particle at a certain, in this case at a certain position R, but there could be also other variables here, right? Not only the position but also find particle with a certain momentum, find particle with a certain orbital momentum, uh, and so on. Okay, so the simplest thing we can do with a wave function is to solve uh, the Schrodinger equation and find solutions for a certain kind of potential, which is called an infinite square well potential or particle in a box 
potential. And here you have now uh, the more general form of the Schrodinger equation written. So this one is a, a full time dependent Schrodinger equation. And so it has a time dependent term uh, and the two terms that are familiar to you from uh, the previous slide, kinetic and potential energy terms. Um, and this, this one is the equation from the last slide, written in a slightly different form with a um, derivative operator written with a nabla symbol. Um, OK, so um, what we know uh, very generally about uh, solving Schrodinger equation in confined systems, right? not in open space, but in confined system, is that we are going to have a discrete uh, set of these solutions E of these energies. That will just going to be a discrete uh, set of these solutions. So discrete set of energy eigenstates. And each energy eigenstate is going to correspond to at least one, or perhaps more, of these wave functions. So these wave functions psi or phi. Here they're written as psi, here they're written as phi. This is also happens a lot in different textbooks. Uh, they're sometimes called different things. And um, all of these wave functions will have this form. So this form includes uh, the exponent here at the end, which has a time dependence in it. So, all eigenstates, uh, which are the solutions of the Schrodinger equation, are uh, called eigenstates, are described by these wave function, and they all evolve uh, with this exponential prefactor, um, uh, which basically, this is a complex number. You have i uh, here and some uh, real values. The Planck's constant is a constant. Uh, energy is a real value, and time is real. Uh, so you have uh, this uh, prefactor just gives you uh, some complex number, so this is just a phase. Uh, so with time, each of the eigenstate evolves uh, its phase. And this is probably as much as we are going to say about time-dependent Schrodinger equation in explicitly in this course. Okay. So uh, it will come up when we consider electrons hopping from one side to the other, uh, perhaps a few times, but um, for most part of the course, we are going to be concerned with these time-independent time independent functions, which are also part of the eigenstate, full eigenstate solution. So I just didn't want to leave the time dependence out of the discussion. I wanted to mention it to you. but. We are going to look at this time independent part most of the time. And so if you solve for that time independent part for an infinite square well in one dimension, you're going to get uh, these solutions. Uh, we can look at the pictorial form of them, or here you have them written out as equations. Um, let's look at the equation first. So um, basically, if you plug in this type of wave function into the upper equation, or if you just solve for the phi and solve the um, uh, time-independent Schrodinger equation, you're going to find uh, these solutions. Where do these solutions originate from? Well, first of all, uh, you got to um, make sure that the wave function fulfills the boundary conditions. And so when you have an infinite wall on the, on the boundary, then the wave function at that point must be zero. So it's zero here, it's zero here, it's zero here, zero at each boundary of each wall, uh, and then zero everywhere here. Then the wave function has to be continuous, so there are no breaks in it. Um, and so it um, starts from zero and then evolves somehow and then goes back to zero at the other wall 
of the potential which is at the distance L. Right? So uh, it has to fulfill these boundary conditions. And so boundary conditions are often help you find the right solutions uh, and they always must be satisfied. Then, of course, the wave function must also normalize to uh, one if you integrate over the entire space, like I told you. And so if you um, uh, try to solve for this, you will find that actually the um, eigenstates in a square well are sine functions. So very simple functions. They, but it's a whole family of these sine functions. And so uh, they're in general described by this sine term where uh, you have the size of the box L uh, that, that plays a role. And uh, the role it plays is to adjust the nodes of the sine functions to have always a node at zero and always a node at L. And this way, the wave function is zero at the walls of an infinite box. And in between, you can have more nodes. Right? So you can have one, zero nodes, one node, two nodes, three nodes in between the two walls. <coughs> so this is also very similar to solving a, a vibrating string. Right, which is uh, rigidly fixed in, at two points. So this is the same math, actually. The equation is also the same, so it's not a surprise. So if somebody already solved this for classical physics of vibrating strings and then saw this equation and said, okay, I know exactly what the solutions are for this. I'm sure this is how it went. They didn't even have to, had to uh, suffer too much to find these solutions. Okay, so this prefactor here takes care of the normalization that the integral of the wave function over the entire space must be equal to one. Um, so it just takes, uh, you just have to take the integral of the square of the wave function from zero to L, put it to one, and you will see that there must be a prefactor here, uh, which scales out the, this length. Uh, that ar arises in that integral. Okay, so um, then the whole family of wa wave functions comes from the fact that solutions for different ends are allowed. They satisfy the Schrodinger equation, and so n equal 1, 2, 3, 4, which gives you the number of lobes. So one lobe, two lobes, three lobes. Uh, corresponds to this n here, uh, so it makes the sine function go faster uh, as you increase n, n is integer, and so n are the quantum numbers, and uh, they are called quantum numbers uh, of a particle in a square potential. So from n, you can tell the eigenvalues of energy, which are these guys. So if you Take the, the sine function, plug in a certain n, and then plug it into the Schrodinger equation. You will find what this e is here, and those e's will be given by this series. And so this is a quadratic series. So it, energy grows with n as n squared, which is also depicted by the spacing of these lines. So this axis here is n squared or energy. I'm oh, sorry, this is not n squared. It grows as n squared. If it were n squared, it would just be... No, it isn't. Yeah, it is n squared. Yeah, so it's energy or n squared. Yeah, so uh, energy level spacing grows as we go higher and higher in energy. So this is a specific to particle in a square, infinite square well. And what's plotted here is the square of the wave function. So you take the sine function and you square it. So for the first one, you get the uh, sine squared, which is like sine 2 of 2. Um, so first of all, the thing that happens is that the entire function beca becomes, of course, positive, because you take a square of it. Um, and uh, then you can see the probability density from this squared amplitude. And you can see that for the lowest state, which is often called the ground state, if you had one particle in this box, 
then the ground state of that particle would be the lowest one, so closest to the ground is the ground state, uh, has a maximum probability in the center of the box. So the center of the box, center of the box is where the probability is maximum. And then, interestingly, for the second state, which is called the excited state, right? The second state is the excited. The first, ex the second state is the first excited state, and the third state is the second excited state. Uh, so it's similar to the European system of naming floors, right? Uh, the first floor is the ground floor, and the second floor is the first floor. And so, you know, if you send a European person up the building, they'll go one extra floor. If you tell them go to the fourth floor, they'll go to the fifth floor. And if you tell them go to the fifth floor, they'll get really confused because there are only four floors in this building. Okay, so this is how this goes. The first excited state is the, actually the second energy state. Um, and it has two maxima. So the probability is highest to find the particle sort of to the side, to the side of this box, right? And then for the third one, there are three maxima, and the maxima are also uh, the lower. Okay, so this is a particle in a one-dimensional box. Very important example. And now, of course, uh, we have some examples of one-dimensional boxes. I will maybe get to this in this lecture. Uh, but uh, most of the boxes are three-dimensional. We live in three-dimensional space, and we can confine a particle in 3D. So uh, what happens then is this term V of x that we had in the Schrodinger equation becomes uh, a function of x, y, z. Right? And if this is indeed a box, so a cube, uh, then this confinement can be written as a sum of v of x plus v of y plus v of z. So then, if so, in this case, you uh, it's very easy to solve Schrodinger equation. If you can separate the variables like this, then a solution for the wave function will become also a sum. No, the solution becomes a product of phi of x, right? Phi of x times phi of y times phi of z. How, however, the energy eigenstate is the sum of e of x plus e of y plus e of z. So from that point of view, we just uh, solve the one-dimensional box, and we can find very easily the solution for a three-dimensional box. Oh, <laughs> no, I, I didn't know how it would uh, show up, but I guess it does something a little crazy here. OK, we can erase this. Right, so the energy solution uh, in that case uh, is just the energy solution, uh, energy eigenstate solution for x plus the same term for y plus the same term for z. So what we have now is three sets of quantum numbers, and x and y and z, that all can run from 1 to infinity. Um, and this is uh, how you solve a particle in a three-dimensional box. Um, of course, there are some interesting situations when, for example, oops, I'm still on the eraser, and x is equal to one, and then and y equal to and z equal to zero, or and x equal to 
and z equal to 0, but and y equal to 1. In these two situations, the energy will be the same. Right? If the box is, uh, has the same uh, Lx, Ly, and Lz. If those are different, then it's not the case. But So there could be some energy degeneracies. Right? But I will not talk about them uh, looking at particle in a 3D box. I'll talk about them looking at the hydrogen atom. Okay, so a little bit later today. Okay. So the wave functions are the product, like I said, uh, the product of sine functions. The wave functions have uh, this normalization, which is a product of the three normalizations, square root of two divided by L, and then sine in the x direction, sine in the y, sine in the z. Now, it's not always possible to separate the variables like this. It is possible for a 3D box, but for an odd-shaped box, which is not uh, rectangular, uh, this, this will not work. So it's not uh, automatic that you can always find the solution so easily. Right? So this is just the simplest example. OK, questions so far? Have you guys all seen this before? Yeah, great. Okay, how about this one? Everybody knows the uh, harmonic oscillator? Okay. All right, well, we are gonna review it, no problem. Um, so, here is the Schrodinger equation again. And now, what is different is that instead of V of X being a, an infinite square well, so V of x 0 between 0 and L and an infinity out, outside, we're going to have this parabola potential. So parabola is a function of x. This should remind you of this kind of system, right? A spring with uh, coefficient k and the mass m attached to the spring, the position of this mass m will be uh, in living in this kind of potential. So if we know very well how to solve this classically, we solve it quantum mechanically, uh, we find a very interesting result, very weird result, that energy levels in a harmonic oscillator are given by this formula. So once again, we have n. This is the quantum number. It just counts the levels from the lowest, from the ground state, then the first excited state, then the second excited state, and so on. So this will be the ground state here, and this will be the excited state. Uh, it counts the levels, but you can see this is not quadratic anymore. So this is just equidistant levels. So sometimes we call this a ladder. Yeah, so it's like a ladder. You can just climb this ladder. Every time you go one step up the ladder, you have to pay the energy of h bar omega, and then you're at the next level. And it costs you the same energy to go from 0 to 1 than it costs you to go from 500 to 501. It costs you always h bar omega. So this is a special case for the harmonic oscillator, for a parabolic potential, not for any other potential, not for a, a quadratic, uh, for the power four potential, only for the parabolic potential. Okay, uh, so uh, in this case, n can uh, is also allowed to be zero. n equal to zero is a solution, and it is the ground state. And so the ground state of a harmonic oscillator has non-zero energy. Right? If you plug in n equal to zero, you will have E zero equal to h bar omega divided by two. And this is called the zero point motion. So it's this qua weird quantum mechanical thing that the lowest energy that your system can have is non-zero. There is some energy even in the lowest energy state. 
You all know about zero point motion? Some? Most? Everybody? Okay. Great. Give me some feedback today, especially because I really want to know what you guys know and what you don't to guide my future lectures. Okay. So uh, I, I expect to see a lot of nodding in the beginning of the lecture, maybe a little less nodding at towards the end, but let's see. Um, okay, so the wave functions actually look very similar to those for a particle in a box, at least at first glance, right? So this is phi zero, the ground state. It has a maximum in the middle, so the probability to find the particle in the middle of the well is also highest in the middle. This is a phi squared. And then the second solution has a node in the center, so actually the probability is highest to the size of the well, and then the number of nodes grows. So in that sense, it's similar. However, these functions are not sign functions. They are something else. They are these functions at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and um, actually, there is a prefactor. Then there is an exponential term. And the most dramatic effect uh, on the eigenstate is from this h, which is not even written out here. But these are ermite polynomials. Right? So this is a certain series of polynomials that gives you these shapes looks at first glance very similar to a sine function, but it's not, okay? It's a polynomial. Another difference between uh, these solutions and solutions for a particle in a box is not just the precise shape of these wiggles, but there is another difference. Can somebody tell me the difference? doesn't go to zero at the end. Right, so at the boundaries, the boundary conditions here are not so rigid. The wall is not infinite, and therefore the wave function is not required to go to zero at the boundary. And we have these tails where the wave function extends beyond the classically allowed position, right? And so this eventually leads to the possibility of tunneling through the barriers and so on. As long as your barriers are infinite, um, you can tunnel. Uh, if your barrier is a delta function, you can still tunnel. OK, and so they, these tails are taken care of by this um, exponential term. So when you go far, far from the center, this guy will bring you to 0 exponentially. They're evanescent exponential uh, decaying terms. Uh, now, this axis here is, again, energy. Uh, and you can see that the wave functions are arranged on this plot uh, equidistantly. So again, to reinforce that the distance between energy levels in a harmonic oscillator is always the same. And in h bar omega, where omega is the frequency of the uh, harmonic oscillator basically tells you how wide this parabola is. Whether it's wide or narrow is uh, driven by omega. So when the parabola is very narrow, omega is smaller or larger? Larger. larger. The larger the omega, the faster the parabola goes up and becomes narrower and narrower. Very good. Okay. So now, comparing two of the simplest, yeah? Um, on the previous slide, was alpha just a constant for, um, is that in the, um, This is probably omega. Yeah. OK. Yeah, it's just taken from a different uh, textbook. Yeah. yeah, sorry about that. Um, OK, so now on the left, we have solutions for a particle in a box. Uh, and on the right, harmonic potential, harmonic oscillator. Um, and you can see that uh, levels on the right are equidistant. And so these are the energy uh, energies of this ladder of levels with this new going from 0 through integers in the positive direction. And the spacing of levels is always h bar omega. 
on the left hand side the levels are not equidistant the distance between the levels grows as we go up the up this ladder so this ladder is very awkward to climb uh, and the, the distance between the levels you can make sure that this calculation is done right it uh, it is like that and so the distance between the levels has n in it whereas here the distance between the levels is constant and here the zero point energy is marked so zero point energy is characteristic not only for the harmonic oscillator but for any quantum state there is always a zero point energy All right, another very important example because this is the potential uh, that atoms uh, exert on electrons around them. And so the solids are made of atoms. We need to review this very briefly. A Coulomb potential or any central potential uh, will have similar features. Uh, this is now for a hydrogen atom, uh, meaning that there is a single proton uh, at the center and one electron orbiting it. Um, qualitatively, it's the same for many atoms, for also larger atoms, but strictly this applies just to the hydrogen atom. And so instead of uh, a V in the Schrodinger equation, we uh, plug in this U, uh, which uh, uh, designates that U is a radially symmetric Function. So no matter which way we're looking, here, 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 if we move away from the center, we're going to hit this 1 over r Coulomb potential. This is an attractive potential for a charged particle. Um, and this is actually, of course, also a nice connection to <laughs> physics too, where uh, you might have been wondering why don't particles fall onto the nucleus. Well, it's because of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, so, the solutions in this case are um, uh, also um, you know, eigenstates, uh, and uh, these, uh, um, because this is a uh, spherically, uh, radially symmetric, uh, centrally symmetric potential, it's convenient to split uh, the solutions into uh, two parts where you have the uh, radial part, uh, we can call it psi of r would be the radial part of the solution and then the orbital part that corresponds to going like this around the nucleus uh, would be a function of some angles uh, in in, uh, in 3D, you need two angles to describe where you are. Um, so for a spherically symmetric potential, you can split the solution like this. Why? It's because our potential only depends on R, and therefore uh, it is completely symmetric in uh, uh, theta and phi, which are two angles of rotation. So for sure, the solution can be written as a product of something that depends on R, and something that depends on the other things. Uh, these are some realistic numbers for hydrogen. Uh, so the solutions you get from solving U of R will be, there will be the deepest one, which will be um, living at, in this case, it's convenient to use negative energies. So we put, um, a energy level outside the potential to be zero, so at infinity, as far away from nucleus to be zero, and then all the solutions inside the well will become negative. And so in this case, the, the deepest one is the most negative, and it is at minus 13.6 electron volts. And all the other solutions are at minus 13.6 divided by n squared. So the second one will be at minus 13.6 divided by 4, and so on. And so they are written, uh, displayed here. So the ground state will be the deepest one at minus 13.6, and this is a, sometimes called a Rydberg, Rydberg uh, constant. So this is uh, really accurately described by 
is quantum mechanics. This is the, the radius from uh, the distance, the classical radius, which is allowed uh, by this trajectory. And so these are uh, growing as you go higher and higher in eigenstate and closer to zero. So the, this um, deepest level, the ground state, has the smallest uh, radius. And then they grow quadratically uh, as we go higher and higher, closer to zero energy in this case. Okay. Of course, we can put zero energy arbitrarily anywhere, but it's just convenient to put it outside of the potential. This potential just infinitely approaches uh, the zero energy. Okay, so um, this is how uh, Schrodinger equation would look like in the uh, radial coordinates. Um, so if you go from x, y, z into r, theta, and phi, uh, you would uh, write down Schrodinger equation like this. And if you solve that, you will find uh, these energy eigenstates uh, for the equation, and uh, this is now more general because this is includes not only a hydrogen atom, but it allows for uh, some uh, larger Z, so more uh, protons at the nucleus, um, and uh, it also so here is the one over n squared comes in here, so this is just from the radial part. And here, there is one more quantum number that comes in. And this is the orbital angular momentum. So they, these states can have a different orbital angular momenta. momenta and so um, only nr comes from the uh, solving the radial Schrodinger equation. And l comes from solving uh, the orbital part. Uh, for the orbital part, uh, it's not written in the slide here, but to remind you, there is uh, also a boundary condition. Right? Even though there is no potential to confine you in the orbital direction, but if you start at one point and you go around, the wave function has to uh, come to the same value. Right? The wave function is single value, so anywhere you start, you go around the circle, you have to have the same value. And that puts a boundary condition on this wave function. And that boundary condition it looks a little bit like confinement. And this gives us this orbital number L. Right? So L can run also through integers and can also run through integers. So in this situation, we have these two principal quantum numbers. Oh, sorry, principal quantum number, they define it as the sum the sum of these. Okay, so again, we don't have time to go really into detail into this solution. If you need a refresher of this, uh, look it up in your quantum mechanical textbook. I just wanted to remind you that there are different quantum numbers when we deal with atoms. And in the textbook for this course, I believe chapter five talks about atomic structure, and that's also a very nice review of these concepts, which I will not explicitly go through in this lecture. I will do it like this through reviewing quantum mechanics. But if you need to remember more chemistry, different bonds between atoms, uh, uh, these stuff, you can also just consult your textbook for this class. OK, so what are the uh, consequences of having these uh, uh, two numbers? Well, this is how. Uh, the wave functions look for the, the lowest few uh, eigenstates. So now in case of these spherical potentials or in case of uh, atoms, we call them orbitals. And uh, what is shown here are s orbitals. That means that l is equal to 0. So remember the quantum number is nr plus l plus 1. So when we put L equal to 0, we can uh, draw what we're going to get for NR equal to uh, 1, 2, and 3. 
So um, again, the same similar story, right? The, the lowest one uh, doesn't have nodes. The second one has a node. The third one has two nodes. In this, in this sense, they're similar. Uh, so the first one is just a spherically symmetric, and 3D is just a, is just a ball uh, with the highest probability at the center. So this electron actually prefers to be living right on top of the nucleus, but it has a probability to be everywhere else uh, with a characteristic radius of um, R, the, which is shown in the previous slide. And then the second S orbital has this node, and then the third S orbital has has two nodes and they also grow as we go higher up. Now, if we, we can also uh, draw these kind of wave functions for L not equal to zero, for L equal to one, L equal to two, and those will be called SPD, they look more complex. Right? Who, who remembers how P orbital looks? The dumbbell? Yeah. Or, uh, Good. Yeah, it's like an infinity sign which has been rotated around its axis, right? So it's, uh, it looks like that. Right. So you can have px, py, pz orbitals, then they can hybridize. Uh, so it becomes pretty complicated. And then there's a, a d orbital that looks like that. So they, uh, they get more and more complex. So you have complexity in n. As you go from n equal to 1, 2, 3, you get these ripples added. And then in the SPD direction, you have uh, these additional nodes as you go around this way. So the wave functions become complex pretty fast. But we don't have to keep them all in my head, in, in our heads. Uh, we can just, uh, you know, for now remember uh, that they, uh, you know, the notations here, and uh, just the, uh, we will not need the details of all the orbital symmetries of these wave functions, right? So we just need to refresh these notations. So for um, a hydrogen atom. Again, you can have this dimension where you go from one, two, three of the n uh, radial degree of freedom, and then you can go SPD uh, this way. But now, remember, energy was proportional to one over n squared, right? And n was equal to nr plus L plus one. So you can see that uh, we can uh, increase N by one, decrease L by one, and we're gonna get the same N, right? So there are some degeneracies that are possible. And uh, this is, of course, doesn't, doesn't work for uh, the lowest energy level where S corresponds to L equal to zero. That means that uh, you all really only have a single level, and this is depicted by one dashed line here. So for the lowest ground state, there is no degeneracy between levels. So you just have a single 1s level. Now, if you are in a 2s, that means that um, nr is equal to 2, and now you can get to this. Uh, total n in several different ways. So you can have uh, 2s, you can have 2p, um, and so for 2s you still have the same story where because s gives you uh, 0, uh, you only have energy which is total of uh, um, 2 from here plus 1, so this this much, and uh, you can don't have any freedom. Now, if you um, make L equal to 1, you can reach the same total N, right? Is this clear what I'm talking about? So you can just play between these numbers, and so actually at P level always has a degeneracy of 3, if you look at it. And then the D level has a degeneracy of 5. So there are 5 energy levels will have the same energy. And actually, 
the way it's drawn here, they really line up all like this, but there are also energy shifts between them in real atoms. And so at, at here is zero, and above it, levels are not discrete. You can have any energy you want. There are no discrete quantum levels. So uh, energy levels can be degenerate. Um, and this is uh, very important for building up atoms. Right? We can put uh, one electron per atom. And so we can put one electron here, one electron here, three electrons here. Uh, and uh, say if we have a certain atom with only uh, five electrons, they will fill up these two energy levels, right? Is this correct? It's not correct. <laughs> <laughs> so what we forgot spin, right? So there, there you, uh, you can actually put two uh, per level because of spin. But we will come back to that a little bit later. Um, all right, but it is very important uh, for solid state physics to know whether the entire shell of an atom is completely filled or if you can put another electron in a shell. And the shells are uh, these 1s, 2s, 2p. Each one of these is a new uh, shell. So everything with a degeneracy is a shell. And so if a particular atom has partially filled 3D shell, everything else is filled. Uh, this is very important, for example, for whether it's a conductor or an insulator. Uh, but it doesn't define it completely. So this chemistry is important, but not the whole story. All right. Questions so far? I wanted to also briefly review uh, what happens when you have a more complicated potential. For example, a double wealth potential, or it's also known as Mexican hat potential, or, or um, um, you know, where this, where we can extend it is to take, if we understand what happens when we have two of these potentials close by, we can also think about what happens if we have infinite number of them close by. And this is what a solid is, and, and a large number of potential wells in a close proximity. So, uh, you know, we can have a, if we just look at the left potential and forget about the right one and it's far away, then we know that there will be some energy levels here, and they will correspond to some wave functions like that. And the same is true for this one. And then when we bring them closer and closer together, because these are not infinite square well potentials, then these wave functions have tails. And these tails will overlap. And so there will be a non-zero probability to find a particle anywhere from somewhere here to, to here. So this will be space where a particle can live. So here this is shown with an oversimplified example of a hydrogen atom. We just reviewed that for a hydrogen atom, we need to consider Coulomb potential, which is one over R potential. But here, hydrogen atoms are approximated by square wells. Not infinite square wells, but square wells. So square wells with a finite depth. And the depth of these wells is adjusted in such a way that the lowest energy solution for n equal 1 would correspond to the exact same energy as you would have in a hydrogen atom. So it's minus 13.6 electron volt Rydberg energy. So the lowest energy solution is this kind of a, a bell-shaped distribution. There is a proton uh, here. And now when we have a hydrogen molecule, so this is also known as a covalent bond, uh, then uh, this is like having two of these potential wells close together on, on some level. Right? So the reason why they attract in a covalent bond you can read up in your textbook. Uh, but for now, it, it is given to us that there are two protons 
at a very short distance from each other, held there by some magical force. Uh, and there are two electrons, uh, one coming from the left hydrogen and right, one coming from the right hydrogen, that these protons brought together with them. Uh, so when they're far away, the story is simple. It's like this, and the other one is far away and has exactly the same solution uh, in it. Uh, and then when they come close together, these two overlap very strongly because the distance is very small and the tail is uh, quite significant. Uh, and so in this case, uh, we have to solve the Schrodinger equation with this complicated potential and we will find the solutions are like that. The lowest energy solution has a shape that reminds you of two of such guys, two of these uh, bumps that were just added, added together. And this is a very close approximation of what happens. Now, in this space where we had only one level available before, there's going to be a second level in this energy interval. There's going to be a second level, and this one is going to look like the two bumps were subtracted from each other. So the left bump is pointing up, the, the right bump is pointing down, and then you add them like that. So what that gives you is a node here. And so this becomes the excited state. And now let's look at the energy uh, positions of these. So this one was at minus 13.6 on the left. And now these two are, one is deeper at minus 17.5. And one is shallower at minus 9. So both of these guys shifted like that and by about the same amount, by approximately the same amount. So where we had one energy level or two degenerate levels when the two protons were far apart, we had two degenerate quantum states for two electrons at 13.6. When they came together, the two split up like that. And this splitting uh, is called exchange energy. So depending on notation, people would call it, for example, two times the exchange energy. So it, it comes from this quantum mechanical exchange, the fact that electrons can tunnel back and forth between these two wells. So once again, to, to get this, you have to solve the Schrodinger equation, but you can also look at the two eigenstates of the two atoms separately, and then say, OK, I'm going to add the two, and I'm going to subtract the two. And these are going to be my new solutions. So we'll look at the probability of these two. These are the pictures at the bottom here. Um, so wave function squared. In this case, looks very much like the electron can be in both wells, or prefers to be somewhere towards uh, the middle between the two atoms. So what they say is, in this case, electron is shared between the two atoms. And in this case, it really makes a choice. Part of the time, it spends on the left. And part of the time, it spends on the right. So if you add that uh, phase term, the time-dependent term that we started with today, you will see that it actually tunnels from left to right uh, all the time. If you want to measure where it is, you're going to get this answer, and then this answer, this answer, and then this answer. So there is a big difference between the lowest energy eigenstates, where electrons kind of sits in between the two atoms, and the second, uh, uh, the first excited state, where it uh, travels left and right. OK. Now a little bit of uh, statistical physics, uh, which is also part of fundamental quantum mechanics. Uh, we can talk about fermions and bosons from the point of view of just the basic quantum mechanics. And then uh, we remember that 
uh, when we talk about bosons, and we have a lot of bosons which are the same particle, um, just the different examples of the same particle, and then we exchange two of these, the wave function before the exchange is the same as the wave function after the exchange. This is what bosons are. And if we talk about fermions, uh, upon this operation, there is a minus sign that appears in the wave function. So if you take this particle and exchange it with this particle, the wave function will get a minus sign, which is, has no physical consequence because anything that we can measure is proportional not to psi, but to psi squared the probability, and so this minus sign just uh, uh, multiplies out and is not measurable. So this experiment is uh, rather useless if we just have fermions or bosons, but there are huge, huge consequences of this, it turns out, in uh, particle uh, statistics, which talks about occupation of energy levels. And so the difference is depicted by these pictures. You can also read the text. For, uh, bosons are protons, neutrons, uh, and then uh, fermions are, uh, uh, sorry, uh, bosons are photons and uh, uh, phonons, or coupled neutrons, like two neutrons, or, uh, and uh, two protons, like alpha particles. And then uh, fermions are protons, neutrons, electrons. Mm -hmm. These kind of particles are fermions. Um, now, the difference is depicted here. So here is a, a harmonic potential. So this is a harmonic oscillator that we saw before. And so the energy levels are equidistant. And um, we are at zero temperature, which means that the particles have no kinetic energy to excite themselves to uh, higher energy levels, so they must choose the lowest energy state available to them. And so what they do in case of bosons, they all pile up at the bottom level. They just all go there. Uh, and this uh, is very different for fermions. For fermions, uh, due to Pauli exclusion principle, which comes directly from this minus sign, which we cannot measure by itself, but through Pauli principle, we can see it. Uh, each level can host a single particle. Now, by level, I mean a unique set of quantum numbers. So we've seen already different kinds of quantum numbers today. We've seen n, we've seen nr, we've seen l, we've seen nx and y and z. So if a state is described by several quantum numbers, like nx and y and z, then the state with a unique set of nx and y and z can only be singly occupied. And this is depicted here. So each level of uh, this harmonic oscillator is populated by a single, a single particle. Um, now, this is the case of zero temperature, uh, easy to uh, handle, but it doesn't happen very often. Although you will see that uh, metals at room temperature um, are not too far from this situation. Surprisingly, to see Bose phenomena, we have to most of the time go very, very cold to see them all lined up here. That's because this energy difference is not very large. And so to see them all occupy the lowest level, we have to lower the temperature quite a bit to not allow them to jump to higher levels. Uh, but the uh, Fermi statistics, uh, Fermi distribution, which we're going to introduce now, will be valuable even at room temperature. We will see why, but not today. <coughs> OK, so uh, from the point of view of statistical physics, uh, so occupation of um, energy levels. Uh, we talk about these occupation numbers. How many particles are there at a certain level? Or what is the average number of particles at each energy? Right? So this is a sort of this classically is a distribution 
uh, function, uh, like you had Boltzmann distribution in uh, classical physics where the higher the energy, the lower the probability to find the particle there. These are the quantum analogs of that. Um, they, they actually go into Boltzmann distribution if you increase the temperature. But this is the quantum mechanical one. Um, now, beta is inverse temperature in these formulas. So you can also replace beta here with 1 over k Boltzmann t. Uh, so k is k Boltzmann. Uh, it already tells you where this is coming from, from statistical physics, where Boltzmann constant always comes about. Um, and so um, if you have this finite temperature, then this formula will give you a mean occupation uh, number <coughs> for a system of bosons, if you have many, many bosons, you have n bosons, uh, for a certain energy. So this energy is uh, Es. This is the energy of the level, and Ns would be the mean occupation number. Uh, mu is uh, some offset energy in case we need it. It has more uh, value for fermions, but also for bosons. Uh, mu is uh, some kind of uh, starting point for counting energy. Also known as the chemical potential. Anybody heard about chemical potential? Yeah. Yes. So chemical potential uh, means, uh, always tells you how much energy you have to pay to add the next particle to the system of n particles. This is a very uh, simple uh, description of the chemical potential. So uh, the role of it in this distribution is not uh, as easy to uh, highlight. It's not my goal here today, but we will encounter chemical potential. And so uh, just uh, maybe write down that the chemical potential is the energy that it takes to add n plus first particle to the system of n particles. Yeah. So this would be very different, for example, for n fermions and for n bosons at the same temperature. Okay, so this is the wave, uh, the, the distribution function for fermions, and actually the difference is just this sign here. Uh, it was a minus for bosons and it's plus for fermions and that makes all the difference in the world uh, this minus sign going into plus um, as I will show you in the next slide okay so let's look at the Fermi distribution uh, which is a distribution for fermions it's, the full name is Fermi Dirac distribution these two guys worked on it together um, and so it is a function uh, with, um, now let me write it again here, n of E, the occupancy of a level with energy E would be 1 divided by 1 plus exponent of energy minus some offset. Here it's called EF, Fermi energy or chemical potential. I'm going to use it interchangeably. Some people would have an issue with that. I like that. So when the energy is very, very large, the energy level is very, very far, uh, and we are at zero temperature, then we have a plus infinity in this exponent. And this function is 0. Now the opposite case. Energy is very, very small. Then we have still 0 in the denominator from 0 temperature. And we have a negative number uh, below. And so we have value 1. Now, we don't have to go very, very far uh, in energy or very, very low in energy. This transi transition is actually extremely sharp. It is like a step. 
Uh, so when energy is just greater than this EF or which is similar to chemical potential. Depends on the definition of the chemical potential, but here I'm going to use them interchangeably. So this is some Fermi energy chemical potential threshold, which is in this formula. When we're just a little bit above it, uh, you have an exponent to the infinity here. And the energy turns, uh, distribution turns to zero. And when you're just below it, you have a one. So what it means is that uh, at zero temperature, all levels up to this EF are occupied. All levels above EF are completely empty. There is a very sharp transition. And so in the harmonic potential uh, picture, we had these discrete energy levels. Uh, we did not have a continuum like it is here, so I could plot these energies here like that and it tells me that for a certain number of particles just these levels will be occupied and the next one will be empty there will be no defects here like this particle we will not find it here at zero temperature so all the levels below a certain level are occupied all the levels above a certain level are empty so this is a the essence the simplest essence of this Fermi distribution and uh, what it means. Okay. And this is what happens at finite temperature. So this is the zero temperature case. All the levels below Fermi level or chemical potential are occupied. All the ones there are empty. And at finite temperature, of course, when you are close to this threshold, EF, the exponential term has some kind of a intermediate value between zero and uh, it gives you between minus infinity and plus infinity. And so the total distribution is somewhere between zero and one. And this is what is shown here. So instead of having a sharp step, now the distribution will be broadened and what that means is that as we add temperature particles in a harmonic potential might start having some deviations from this perfect occupancy so for example here i draw the lowest levels are all occupied because we are far away from this EF and we have just one here so the lowest levels are occupied but then up here close to EF there's one particle just went up and there is a an empty space here uh, and this is reflected by the fact that here the occupancy of levels even though we are below EF is not one and so we have uh, some levels have to be empty and here above the Fermi threshold, there is some finite occupancy of levels. And so some of the levels above are occupied. Of course, it is a little bit um, difficult to explain this with this kind of a simple single harmonic oscillator system, but imagine a solid where uh, each uh, atom contributes a potential well, and there are many, many electrons and many, many levels. Like I showed you with two wells, each level gives you a level, uh, each well gives you a level, and then they split. Uh, if you have a solid with many, many levels, uh, then these kind of statistical descriptions become very, very important. When we're talking about billions and uh, 10 to the you know, 23 electrons, then they all behave according to this distribution. You have many, many energy levels, and some of them are empty, some of them are occupied at a fixed temperature according to this distribution. This is with a little bit more realistic numbers. This is just n, the number uh, probability of occupation between 0 and 1 for each level. And uh, this is a real energy scale in electron volt. So you have sort of, uh, tens of milli electron volts. The width of this distribution for different temperatures um, the width here 
is of the order of kT. The precise width is perhaps three times kT, but the order of magnitude is kT. Okay. The precise width is, depending on the calculation, you might get 3.5 kT, uh, something like this, but it's still of the order of kT. So as you increase the temperature, the distribution smears out, and you have more and more particles above the zero temperature threshold, and you have some empty states below. And this is due to thermal excitations to higher energy states. You're no longer in a ground state. And you have to use statistical physics to describe what happens. So <clears throat> this is precisely how you use these distributions if you need to find something useful about the system. Um, this formula simply states that the total number of particles should be equal to n. And so what it does is it sums over all energy levels s. s would be your quantum number, for example, in this case, like n in the particle in the box case. And then beta is temperature, and mu is the chemical potential. Uh, and uh, so summing over the entire distribution should give you n particles. So uh, this can tell you, for example, what is your chemical potential, because one you start counting particles and once, once you reach n, that the highest energy of that is your chemical potential. Uh, if you have 10 to the 23 particles like we have in uh, solids, then you don't sum them up, you replace it with an integral because it becomes really a continuous variable rather than a discrete set of energy levels s, it becomes just a continuum of levels. Uh, and in that case, this formula becomes this. And here, you multiply n, which is the Fermi distribution, or Bohr's distribution, depends on what we're talking about. But if we're talking about electrons, it would be a Fermi distribution. And times this, in this case, it's called F of epsilon, which is the density of states, uh, which tells you at this energy epsilon, how many energy levels are there? Like in a single atom, right? At a certain energy, we have this sp degeneracies. We could have several energy levels at one energy. Uh, in a solid, these degeneracies can be massive. And so we need a continuous function, which is called density of states, to describe a continuous distribution. And so this formula becomes this. Here, we explicitly sum overall energy levels and here, we integrate multiplying by the density of states. So you can solve this equation to find mu. You can find mu for a given n by solving this equation. So what should be the chemical potential such that all the particles below it add up to n for a certain temperature? Um, and then if you want to find the average energy using these functions, what you do is you integrate energy times the density of states times the occupation of each state. So this just tells you at this energy, with this many available states, probabilistically these many will be occupied. And then let's integrate the entire energy spectrum, and this will give us the mean energy. So these are the examples of how you use Fermi distribution or Bose distribution in when you need to find something specific like energy or chemical potential. So this is my small introduction to uh, statistical physics, and I think we have to stop here. Uh, we're going to spend a little bit of time reviewing spin uh, next week, and then we're going to dive into condensed matter or solid state physics.